So for metals, the transition metals can be like the tricky part in there. And we said that ions, or sorry, the anions always have a fixed charge. So there's kind of no guessing with the anions. So anions have their own tricky part. Um, and that is that a lot of anions are going to be polyatomic. There are some polyatomic cations as well, but particularly in this class, the anions are most are the ones that we're going to see as polyatomic ions most frequently. So what we mean by a polyatomic ion is when you have an ion that contains more than one atom. So you can look at the table here and you can see a whole list of polyatomic ions that have uh, basically multiple atoms in it. So for instance, carbonate is CO3 2 minus. It has a carbon and it has three oxygens and that gets you to a negative two overall charge. So you basically need to memorize the ones here that are in bold, carbonate, nitrate, hydroxide, phosphate, and sulfate. And then I also want you to know bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus. I don't really want you to know it as hydrogen carbonate. I want you to know it as bicarbonate. And if you're wondering why, um, like carbonate and bicarbonate make an important physiologic buffer system. It's what keeps our blood at around pH 7.4. Um, Nitrates are important in a lot of foods and processing and kind of in our bodies. Uh, hydroxides are going to be relevant whenever we talk about pH. Uh, phosphates are going to be important when we talk about DNA a lot. And then sulfates are very common in a whole lot of um, pharmaceutical type drugs. They're sold as kind of uh, sulfate molecules. So all of these ones that I'm having you memorize, there's a reason for them and they're very common. We're going to see them um, show up quite a bit in this class. I have a little trick that can help you figure out the charge of these polyatomic ions. So for instance, if you know the formula and can't figure out the charge. Um, so let's, for as an example, go with NO3. And let's say you have nitrate, right, NO3, and you can't remember for the life of you what the charge of that is. You know it's NO3, you just don't know the charge. What you can do is go to a periodic table and look at the charges of each of those individually. So let's go back to, um, here's our periodic table. So oxygen, we know, is always going to have a negative 2 charge. So whenever you have any of these polyatomic um, ions, the anion part, the, the negative charge, um, let's, let me rephrase this. The one that's on more on the right, so in this case we have an N and we have, whoops, we have an N and we have an O. So here's our N and our O. Usually those would both be anions. Oxygen would be negative two and nitrogen would be negative three. But whichever one is closer to the noble gas, we're gonna use that one as a negative charge. And then the one to the left, right? So you have them lined up. The one that's more on the left is going to have a positive charge. So how in the world could nitrogen have a positive charge? Well, usually it would gain electrons to look like neon, but in this case, it actually loses electrons. So it's going to lose one, it's going to lose two, it's going to lose three, it's going to lose four, then it's going to lose five electrons to be like a noble gas, and it's going to look like helium after it loses those five. So nitrogen is actually going to have a plus five charge here. So now taking those numbers and going back to our question here, well, if nitrogen had plus five, and oxygen had minus 2, but we have 3 of them. That's going to be plus 5 and minus 6, so that means overall the charge of nitrate would be negative 1. So that trick would work with carbonate, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, pretty much all of them. Um, for hydroxide, oxygen would be negative 2 and hydrogen would be plus 1. For the bicarbonate, it would be just like carbonate, and then the hydrogen adds a plus 1. So again, for all of your polyatomic ions, you can figure out the charge using that way. You can also just memorize them, but I like giving you kind of an alternative way to figure it out if you need to. Now, whenever you're going to write your formulas for your polyatomic, um, with compounds with polyatomic ions, uh, it's the same rules as we did before. So basically, you're going to name your cation, then you're going to name your anion. So in this case, you would have, for instance, barium, your anion would just be sulfate. This is why you need to know the names of them because it's going to be barium sulfate. Okay. There are times when your cation and anion are going to have unequal charge. And again, you're going to have to use um, subscripts then.
to balance things out, right? So in this case, Mg2+, plus, magnesium has a 2 plus charge. Hydroxide, OH minus, has a negative 1 charge. So this means that we're going to need two OH minuses to balance out this charge. So we need to write this as MgOH with parentheses then 2. So let me explain why the parentheses are needed. If we were just to have written MgOH2, what this would mean is we have one magnesium, we'd have one oxygen, and we have two hydrogens. And what we really have with this is we have an Mg with a 2 plus, and then we have two different, you have an OH minus there, and you have another OH minus up there. So really we have two oxygens and two hydrogens. Or another way to say is we have two separate OH minuses. Well, when you have two separate OH minuses, you need to write it this way with those parentheses and not this way because that would be wrong. So... If you need more than one of your polyatomic ion, you have to put it in parentheses and then use your, your subscript to say how many of them there are. All right, so let's do a few um, practices here. So sodium and OH minus and then sodium and sulfate. So for sodium is Na plus. So Na plus and plus OH minus is going to give us NaOH. And we would write it just like that. We don't need parentheses or anything like that because it's one of each. For Na plus plus SO4 2 minus, what you can see here is that this has a plus charge. This is a negative 2 charge. So we're going to need two of these to balance out. So in this case, it's going to be Na2 SO4. We don't need parentheses around the sodium because we're just using this to refer to the Na in general. So in other words, the only time we're going to need the parentheses is when we're looking at something that is polyatomic. And we'll have an example on that coming up here right now. So for calcium and OH minus, it's going to be Ca. Calcium has a charge of 2 plus, so you can look at your periodic table and, and verify that. Plus OH minus is going to form what? Well, in this case, we can see we're going to need two of these OHs to balance out. So because of that, we're going to write this as CA, and then in parentheses, OH and 2, because we need two of those OHs to balance out the calcium. And then finally, we have... Ca2 plus plus SO4 2 minus. Since it's an equal charge on both, we just kind of squish them together and we would say CaSO4 and we'd have calcium sulfate. So that's kind of the way you would write the formula for these. Now, naming ionic compounds with polyatomic ions, you probably just heard me do it on the previous slide. You name the cation and then you name the anion. You don't specify the charge. You don't say how many of there are there or anything. So it's really the same naming rules as with any other um, ionic compound. So in this case, if you have Na, then HCO3. Sodium is the Na part. The HCO3 is bicarbonate. Um, Al2, SO4, 3. The Al part is the aluminum. The SO4 is the sulfate. So it's just aluminum sulfate. Uh, for ionic compounds in general, um, they tend to have some very unique uh, physical properties, and that is that they're going to be solids, and they're all going to have very high melting points and boiling points. And whenever I mean really high, I mean like really high. So in order to take sodium chloride and melt it, so to turn it into a liquid, you'd have to heat it to 801 degrees Celsius. That's really, really hot. To boil it and to get it into a gas, you have to go up to 1,413 degrees Celsius. Good luck getting there, but that's what you would need to do. Add a whole lot of heat to it. Um, so that's really not that much of a concern for us in anything we're going to be doing in this class. Just know that there are going to be solids with um, high melting points and boiling points. The more important thing is the second part. So whenever you take an ionic compound and you put it in water, it's going to result in the 
ionic compound dissolving and then separating into the cation and then the anion. So if you were to take some salt, sodium chloride, and put it into water, what happens as a result is the Na plus and the Cl minus ions separate from each other and they all get kind of surrounded by water. So as a result, you have free Cl minus floating around, free chloride ions floating around, and free sodium ions floating around. And this resulting solution is going to conduct a current, right, because there's charge there. Um, and that's going to be an important thing when we look at uh, solutions and things later on in the semester is understanding that these ionic compounds dissolve in water and then they separate into these individual pieces like this. Um, so if you're wondering all this talk about ionic compounds, when am I ever going to see these in real life? Well, here's an example for you, or actually three examples. Um, if you've ever taken Tums, Tums is calcium carbonate. So CaCO3, calcium carbonate, that, that's Tums. Um, it's an antacid, right? So if you have, have an acid reflux or something, the calcium carbonate kind of um, reacts with the acid and neutralizes it. Uh, magnesium hydroxide. Um, that's the active component in Maalox. Uh, the last one, iron sulfate. So if you have anemia, anemia means you basically have low iron levels. Um, if you have low iron levels, your doctor doesn't tell you to grab a you know, piece of iron metal and just start chewing on it, right? That's no fun for anyone. Instead, you take an iron supplement, and it comes in the form of iron sulfate. And the idea here is whenever you um, put iron in your body, you want this iron 2 plus. So notice how it's iron 2 sulfate, right? Iron 2 sulfate, because that's specifically the type of iron that's going to bind to oxygen in your hemoglobin. If you had iron 3 sulfate, that wouldn't do you any good. That could actually be really um, bad for you. Um, and just regular old iron that's not in the ion, ionic form also doesn't do you any good. So this is just some example of some useful ionic compounds, and actually later on in this semester we'll talk about quite a few more as well.